Good morning, y'all. So today, we'd like to share a part of our story that involves a trip that we took to Honduras several years ago. But before we do that, we'd like to say a prayer of blessing over students that will be taking part in four different global service trips over spring break this next week. Some of our students are seated, uh, seated down uh, in the front this morning, along with the leaders. And before Rachel prays for those, I'd like to introduce each group. And when you're introduced, please stand and stay standing for the blessing. So like I said, we have four groups. The first group is a group of pre-health students going to Guatemala with Health Talents International. Next, we have um, members of ACU CEO chapter going to Honduras uh, to work with Mission Lazarus. Next, we have students going to the Dominican Republic with MANA Global Ministries. And last but not least, we have students and members from the Hillcrest Church of Christ going to Southeast Texas to help with Harvey cleanup and rebuilding. So now, if you're comfortable doing so, please join me in standing and lifting a hand of blessing toward these students from where you're seated, while Rachel says a prayer of blessing over them. Let's pray. To the God who sends and goes with us and holds us along the way, I pray, God, that you bless these students and their accompanying leaders as they go to serve you. Prepare the way for them. Keep them safe. Keep Satan, our enemy, at bay. Bless the students throughout this school as they travel next week. Bring them back to us. But for these that are dedicating their time to serve in your name, I thank you, God. Bless them and also the Halbert Institute for helping them send to go where you've placed us over spring break. In Jesus' name, amen. So today, as we continue the This Is Us theme that we've used throughout the semester, We'd like to spend a few minutes sharing with you about a story of disappointment in our lives and what we're continuing to learn from it. There have been very few instances in our lives where the things that we've planned have gone exactly the way that we've wanted to. When things don't go our way that we want or we expect, we were left with a lot of questions and doubts. But we're learning to see God in the midst of our disappointments and thwarted plans. Specifically, we hope that you will see that in this particular situation, we have grown more intentional with our relationships, more open-minded with our future, and more respectful and honoring to a God that goes before us and knows what we need more than we do. With our history, you think that we would have this wisdom down pat by now. Let me give you a few examples. When we were engaged the first time, it blew up and we spent a lot of time apart. God had to heal us individually when he brought us back together. It was a thing of beauty. My first position as a counselor evaporated right in front of my face when the owner of the practice suddenly announced that the practice was closing. This jeopardized our financial position as Chris was in law school and I was his sugar mama. How were we going to pay the bills? Later. Chris joined a large law firm. He hated it. A few years later, I suffered a miscarriage. Further down the road, we relentlessly pursued a house purchase that was never going to happen. Through all of this mess, God chose to bless us through our striving. He has blessed us in ways we could never dream or imagine. 
So I first traveled to Honduras as part of an ACU mission trip during my senior year. Since then, I'd always wanted to go back, and that opportunity came in 2011 when I was providing legal advice to a ministry uh, called Heart of, Heart of Christ Honduras. That ministry served um, and sought justice for victims and survivors of sexual assault and abuse. Based on Rachel's background in psychology and passion for preventing abuse, I volunteered her, without her permission, to go and do a multi-day training in Honduras for that ministry, but also for other professionals like teachers and ministers and doctors to recognize child abuse. While we were there, we also visited an orphanage, um, a, a maternity ward, and it was during that time that Rachel subtly reminded me about her desire to adopt. I don't know what Chris means by suddenly here. If you know me, there is not a subtle bone in my body. I had had a dream that we had four kids. Okay, let's do some math. We have two kids, so that means two were mythical creatures. Also. Two more kids were not medically possible if you catch my drift. Something had to change. In my mind, my logical conclusion was we were going to adopt. Chris's logical solution was she has lost her mind. Here's the thing. After returning from Honduras, we both knew that we had to do something. Suddenly my dream of adoption looked like it would become a reality. So the week after returning from Honduras, we began the adoption process. That was the spring of 2011. That next year included fundraising, including our church, family, and friends, background checks, psychological assessments, hours of mandatory training, home studies, visits to doctors, the Honduran consulate in Houston, and even the Department of Homeland Security in Lubbock. That also included lots of prayers and anticipation. And in 2012, a year after that process began, we were approved to adopt and began at number 70 on the wait list. At that point, we were told that we would likely be matched with a child or children in six to 12 months. We waited, and we waited. Through government and departmental shutdowns in Honduras, multiple revisions to our paperwork, and even a shutdown of the program through our adoption agency. Full of ourselves, we convinced the adoption agency to keep us on as clients to keep the process going. And we waited. One year turned into two, then three, and then finally four. Until April 2016, after five years in the process and six months at number one on the wait list, we didn't know whether we were supposed to simply keep waiting or not. With no end in sight, we established a deadline and prayed that God would answer us one way or another. While we endured what seemed like years of endless waiting, five years is a long time, y'all. Um, God spoke to us through an older couple that had known us and seen us through so many things since our years in, ju in junior high, in fact. They sat across from us in our living room and gently submitted to us that maybe God had a different plan, that maybe there was an alternative to what we wanted, and at this point, what we needed to happen. They submitted that maybe our third and fourth children were the students, the many different students that we teach and serve at ACU. This idea wasn't radical or new to us. It's like they had spoken aloud what was rattling around in our hearts and our minds for quite some time. Here's the thing, we listened to them because they were our people, they were our community, they knew our hearts, they knew our minds, and they've walked this before us. 
they understood what ACU and her students meant to us. So when the deadline came and went with no further um, and further along in the process, we decided to withdraw our application to adopt. Over the past two years, the pain and the sadness of that decision has never really gone away. However, through time and prayer and reflection, we've been able to see that God was with us throughout our journey and continues to use it to reveal himself to us. God was with us in the beginning, he provided an opportunity for us to serve and to work together as a couple, to spread his love and hope on our trip to Honduras. This has kept us in connection with ministries in Honduras, and we continue to find ways to help. We also felt God through the process. He was our comfort during the waiting. He nudged us to invest in the opportunities in front of us, and he reminded us that he was in control. Okay, I think it's important here to sit with this, because this happened in the waiting. We felt God in the disappointment. As I previously said, he provided a faith community to support and encourage us. So this allowed us to be honest about our journey and to be honest with God. Then he listened in our morning. I remember clearly one day I was looking out the window washing dishes and I saw our daughter Alice Ann playing and singing to herself. She'd asked for years for a sister, and I was not going to give her one. And just as I began to crumble and Chris heard my first sob, he rushed in and he held me and he said things like, Babe, we will reverse the paperwork. I will call Honduras and ask for a kid. Y'all, he was going to call the country and ask for a kid. That's funny. But he knows me, and at that moment, this is God saying, I am with you, I hear that you are hurting. This was also unrealistic. It was a way that God used Chris to remind me that while we both were mourning, I was not alone. And then also, I felt God. We felt God in our frustration. While we were grieving through a year of milestones, I was decorating for Christmas, and I opened a box of Christmas decorations, and there were six stockings in there. I had ordered and prepared in anticipation of celebrating with four kids. As I sat there with that box, I railed against God and I was so very angry. But somewhere deep embedded in me came the story of Jesus and Martha, the righteously indignant sister of Mary, who says, I have worked so hard. I have prepared so long for this. And Jesus says to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, indeed only one. This daily walk is still not always easy, but he continues to make us stronger as a couple and remind us that we still have many opportunities to love and serve those that he puts in our lives. And just today, he provides us with the strength to testify about our journey. And finally, we feel God in the future. When we face, when we are faced with hearing no or disappointments now, we don't despair. We've been through this. We know that he has a plan for it all. While that doesn't make it easy, it provides us with hope to wait, to listen, and to see what he has in store. It creates a posture so that we allow his will and not ours to be done. It allowed us to let go of an identity that the adoption provided for us and to be open to who God really wanted us to be. I like the way the message translation puts Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. It says there, trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen to God's voice in everything you do. Everywhere you go, he's the one who will keep you on track. 
Don't assume that you know it all. We wanted to share this with y'all today because we know that when you trust somebody with your story, we find out that we are more alike than we are different. I'm sure you have or will face disappointment in your life, and we hope that our story will remind you that God is there as well. Thank you for your time and the space provided here. We love and pray for you all. You're dismissed.